was unlimited because it was theater of the mind. It was, it's, as I, the only thing I wrote in radio that I'm proud of was the opening to CBS Radio Workshop, which says, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. We use that every week. Bill Conrad would come on booming that. But that's really what radio was about. You could say we're in Cairo. You could say we were in New York. You could say we're now, and sound effects did it for you. And actors who were so incredible that they could create any character instantly. The cast in those radio shows, probably the, some of the great actors of all times. The man you're listening to is William Frug. He was instrumental in bringing the CBS Radio Workshop back to the air. CBS was still airing dramatic programming on Sunday afternoons. In 1957, Frug became the VP of programming. He took the position against his will. Did you stay with the show till the end? I stayed with the show until they blackmailed me. Howard called me from New York and said, you got a choice. A guy, Della Chapa, is going to CBS television. It means his job is open as vice president of programs, which I did not want. He said, we have decided no executive can collect the salary as an executive and also pick up a talent fee, which I was doing, $150 a show to produce and direct the Columbia workshop. He said, the management's decided you can't be both an executive and talent. So either you take Della Chapa's job or you lose the Columbia workshop. However, if you'll take the vice president job, we'll pay the same money you're making. You won't lose any money. I flew back to New York and said, Howard, I don't want the job. I don't want to wear a suit and tie. I love writing and producing. He said, I know, but we have to have somebody fill this job. I said, we're all slowly vanishing, and you and I know that. I took the job, and I think it was like, three or four hundred dollars a week. I'm very grateful for the money, but I had to give up all producing and directing. I did it for one year and begged out. The CBS Radio Workshop, a reimagining of the old Columbia Workshop, had debuted with the critically acclaimed two-part adaptation of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World on January 27, 1956. It was in its second season in 1957, and unfortunately on the chopping block. Frug stayed with the CBS radio workshop until 1957. Afterwards, Anthony Ellis took over Hollywood's production. Paul Roberts was the New York counterpart. So that's how it came back. Thereafter, I was in charge of all of them and laid out some of all the programs, I think. Stan Freeberg and I had been doing work together, and I suggested to him we'd do a dissertation on satire, which we did, and then we did a Japanese haiku show, and we did... Jimmy Blue Eyes, which was an idea of Sam Pierce's, we'd do anything. That was the fun of it. So were you the one then on the CBS Radio Workshop, the one who made the decision of which shows, which scripts would be selected yes. and used? Uh, some of them were done from New York, uh, like alternate weeks. I was in charge of the ones from Hollywood. Howard Barnes and Paul Roberts were in charge of the ones from New York. Ours were the good ones. <laughs> on Sunday, September 22, 1957, with no national sponsorship forthcoming, the CBS Radio Workshop went off the air with an adaptation of Sinclair Lewis's Young Man Axelrod. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination. The theater of the mind. As fresh when first we came to Yale, from round 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 round, examinations made us pale. From round 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 round, Eli 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 Yale. From round 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 round, Eli 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 Yale. From round 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 round. On college campuses. Across the nation from Bowdoin in Maine to Occidental in California this Indian summer afternoon, the freshman class is anxiously settling down to the first of its bright college years. For them, we have a story. It is a tender legend of the Yale of yesteryear, Young Man Axelrod, written by Sinclair Lewis, Yale class of 1907, and dramatized for the workshop and directed by William N. Robeson, class of 1928. Narrated by John Hoysrott, class of 1926. And most particularly, dedicated to the Yale class of 1961. 
Young Man Axelbrod. Here's the good old Yale, drink it down, drink it down. Here's the good old Yale, drink it down, drink it down. Here's the good old Yale, see so hearty and so hail. Drink it down, drink it down, drink it down, down, down. It was a September afternoon in one of the years between the two world wars. The great elms of the old campus wore the last of summer's greenery. The warm sun caressed the gothic crag of Harkness and spread a golden sheen on the weathered bricks of Connecticut Hall before which Nathan Hale, class of 1773, forever stands in bronze, despairing that he has but one life to give for his country. Into this timeless scene, through the entry between Osborne and Vanderbilt Halls, strode an anachronistic figure, a rugged, white-bearded old man, wearing a neatly pressed black broadcloth suit and celluloid collar, Knut Axelbrod, retired Minnesota farmer, a man with a destination, the office of the dean of Yale College. Come in. Excuse me, uh, you are the dean of the college? Yes. I am uh, Knut uh, Axelbrod. Yes, Mr. Axelbrod. What can I do for you? I am here about uh, entering college. I see. And where is the young man? The young man? Yes. Your son, or perhaps your grandson? Oh, uh, no, sir. It, it's me. Uh, it is I. You? <clears throat> well, uh, I must say this is rather irregular. No, sir. Everything is regular. I pass all the examinations. It wasn't easy, but I pass. <clears throat> yes. Yes, 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 so I see. Yes, here's your name, Knut Axelbrod. Yeah, that's me. Yes, yes, yes. Everything seems to be in order. But, Mr. Axelbrod... Yeah? If you please pardon me for saying this, but you are not, well, not exactly the usual age of our beginning students. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah I know, but... Um... What? Well, there's a fella said once... Uh... Youth is so wonderful, it is a shame it must be wasted on the very young. But... And uh, I feel still young. Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure you do. But I'm still curious. About what, Dean? Why Yale? Why did you want to come to Yale? Well, uh, uh, how could I say that? Uh, yeah. All my life I work hard. I farm my land, I raise my family, I get up with the sun, I go to bed with the sun, and always I say... That is not enough. Always I say, Knut, you are a dummy. I say, what good is a man without education? And then when my last son is grown man, I quit. I give him the farm and I say, Knut, now you can get education. So I read. All day long I read. Sometimes half the night. I, I read almost all the books in the public library back home in Urolemon. Then one day I uh, read the book about Yale. And I say, by golly, I got to go there and, and learn some more. Um, what book did you read? Stover at Yale. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, Mr. Axelbrod, you understand that Yale has changed a lot since that book was written. Oh, Yale is Yale. I believe that. Oh, so do I, sir. But Yale is for... Well, what I mean to say is... That, um... What you mean to say is uh, maybe uh, Yale is for the learning of beauty? Eh, yes. Yes, I suppose that is what I meant to say. And so Knut Axelbrod was duly registered as a freshman in Yale College and assigned a room not in Berkeley Oval where the cream boys of the prep school cliques lolled in comparative luxury, but in a grubby frame building far down High Street where were lodged the unplaced freshmen, the scrub seniors and assorted grinds and self-help students. Here he met his roommate, Ray Gribble. Come in, door's open. Are you Mr. Gribble? Yeah. I am Mr. Axelbrod. And whatever you're selling, I don't want any. Oh, well, I'm not uh, selling anything. I am your new roommate. Y your what? Your roommate. 
Who said so? The fellow at the registrar's office. He said to come here, room 18, and he said my roommate will be Mr. Gribble. Uh, well, beggars can't be choosers. Uh, please? No, nothing. Uh, you can have that bed over in the corner. Got a couple of broken springs, I'm afraid. You know how it is. First come, first serve. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you, Mr. Gribble. Wait, wait, freshman, wait. Wait while the song smites the sky. Knut Axelbrod set out to savor the college he had learned from a book. He sat on the Yale fence in what he felt was an appropriate pose, not knowing that this was no longer done, not realizing why the undergraduates snickered as they passed. He went out to Yale Field to watch the football tryouts, but when he tried to get acquainted with the beefy candidates, they clearly indicated they thought he was crazy. Everywhere, his warm overtures of friendship were met with the cruel, cold disinterest of youth. He was not a campus character. He was the class freak. T'was brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the bore groves. Hey, Axelbrod, pipe down. I got a math assignment to finish. Oh, I'm sorry, Gribble. <laughs> you know, but this, this book, by golly, it's so funny. What book? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland? Is that your English assignment? Oh, no. Well, then why are you wasting your time on it? Uh, it's funny, by golly. <laughs> well, I don't understand you, Axel Broad. I just don't understand you. Why? I'm a simple fellow. Well, it strikes me a man of your years ought to be thinking about saving his soul instead of reading children's books. Oh, I don't think Alice in Wonderland is very much for children. It says some pretty deep things in a funny way. Rubbish. And my soul's in pretty good hands. I go to chapel every morning. It's compulsory. Axelbrod, what is your purpose in life? What do you hope to get out of Yale? I can't say it very well, but um, there was a fellow once uh, maybe said it better. He said, truth is beauty and beauty truth. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. You try to buy a meal with truth and try paying the rent with beauty. Uh, the same fellow said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness. Yes, but remember Longfellow's exhortation. Uh, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate. Still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor. Yeah, but another fellow said, the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Oh, you are a hopeless romantic, Axel Broad, and I doubt if you will ever amount to a hill of beans. Hi, Gribble. Hi, Atchison. Well, well, how's old man Axel Broad tonight? Good evening, Atchison. I think our bearded wonder is in his second childhood. I just caught him reading Alice in Wonderland. You'd do better to work on that English assignment for tomorrow, that merchant of Venice. I can't make head and a tail out of Shakespeare. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth like a gentle rain from heaven. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives. Well, you know it by heart. I learned it a long time ago. Yeah, but do you know what it means? Yeah, I think so. That beats me. Well, listen. What is that? The whiffin' poofs over at Maury's. Whiffin' poofs? What is whiffin' poofs? A whiff and poof is an undergraduate with a rich father and a so-called singing voice. He's got nothing to worry about. He can afford to hang around Maury's and drink beer and sing every night. His old man pays the bills. He doesn't have to work for his education the way fellows like Atchison and I do. But if it weren't for us, they'd never get through college. We wait tables for them, we tutor them. I we... think it's not so bad to enjoy life when you're young. I think radio began its decline at the end of World War II, with the development of television, probably late 40s, early 50s. Almost 1950 exactly would, as when I would date it from. TV was taking over. What happened was just economics, because the management of, of whom I was a part just said, your budget is cut, your budget is cut. Amos and Andy were brought back as disc jockeys. It was just economics. And gradually shows were just left out of the schedule. I think the final thing I realized... I got an offer to go into television, and I didn't want to go into television, but I knew my job was vanishing. But uh, I really knew it was vanishing. After I left and took a job at Screen Gems as a writer-producer, they never replaced me. I was the last vice president of CBS Radio. <laughs> 
But life cannot be only good talk before a crackling fire. Dawn comes cold, dawn comes gray, dawn brings reality. As Knut Axelbrod walked across the morning empty campus, he knew what he must do. Age and youth, they just don't mix. This beautiful place belongs to the young men, not to me. And that boy, well, if I saw him again, it would not be the same. I tell him all I got to say tonight. Next time I wouldn't be young man, Axelbrod. I'd just be an old boar. I live 65 years for tonight. It was worth it. The afternoon in the day coach of a westbound train. An old man sat smiling, a look of great content in his eyes, and in his hands a small book in French, though the curious fact is that this old man couldn't read one single word of French. Eli, 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 yeah. on the round, the round, round, round. Eli, Eli, you have listened to the CBS Radio Workshop production of Young Man Axelbrod by Sinclair Lewis, adapted for radio and directed and produced by William N. Robeson. John Hoyt was the narrator. Carl Swenson played Young Man Axelbrod, and others in the cast included John Daner, Dick Crenna, Jackie Kelk, Ben Wright, and Frank McDonald. The chorus was under the direction of Amerigo Marino. With this program, we conclude the current series of workshop productions. We wish to thank the many, many loyal listeners whose constructive and intelligent letters have encouraged, inspired, and directed our efforts in presenting plays in the theater of your mind. We look forward to resuming this rewarding task in the not-too-distant future. Until then, thanks and goodbye. This is the CBS Radio Network. Dan and I were just talking about, on the, a little while ago, about Bill Robeson who was a rather difficult man. Yes. <laughs> Egocentric to a fault. Oh, always wore capes. Didn't he wear capes? <laughs> <laughs> but he could have been the Phantom of the Opera. I yes, guess. that kind of thing. I think it had red silk lining or something. But, uh, and he wasn't really difficult, but he was... He made himself known. Yes, he was a very commanding president. Commanding indeed. And he well, he wanted to rewrite that. every script. I mean, you, you, yes. the, the original script had no resemblance to the mm -hmm. final product. Right. right, and he did Calling All Cars. Oh, well, yes, he, yes. Yeah. One of yes. the first uh -huh. things that mm -hmm. I remember. And a lot of Big Town. Mm -hmm. was, uh, he did Big Town. Yes, too. Big and Suspense, he did some Suspense. After the workshop signed off for the final time, Suspense signed on, directed by William N. Robeson and guest starring Jackie Kelk and Jeanette Nolan. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Whether you call it by the poetic phrase, the silver cord, or more prosaically just mother's apron strings, Smother love can louse up the life of a growing boy. Complicate it with what child psychologists call sibling rivalry, and the boy may cease growing altogether, at least emotionally. Of such elements is Greek tragedy made, and as it happens, the story you are about to hear. Listen. Listen then as Jackie Kelk stars in Shadow on the Wall, 
which begins in exactly one minute. Now, how many of you have heard a doctor lecture on the lining of the stomach and what you're doing to it? Suspense well, was a very, very important show. I must say that I was not the director of Suspense in its heyday. Bill Spear was. And Bill Spear did not create Suspense, but made it the great show that it was. I came along at a time when radio was paring down all of the adjuncts to great production in terms of money for stars, money for cast, money for orchestra, etc., etc. And the doctor told him that before he could get well, he'd need a new coat for it. Mike thought that over and made up his mind that a buffalo robe with hair on it was just the thing. So he sat down and swallowed one. He could drink any amount of whiskey after that. And that's a fact. (laughs) Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past. And I guess we Americans have our share of some tall ones. And now... Shadow on the Wall, starring Jackie Kelk. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Soon, very soon now, there'll be a shadow on the wall. Shadows, always shadows. I'll never get away from them. I've been watching them for days now. Or is it weeks? I don't know anymore. But I do know it started the last day of my brother's life. My brother. My dear, dear older brother. A thief. All my life he had stolen from me. Stolen my father's respect and then my mother's love. Now he was determined to steal the last hold I had on life. The house. The house where I was born and grew up out on Long Island. He was building a modern monstrosity on the estate a few hundred yards away. And when it was finished, the house, mother's house, was to be wrecked. It was just too much. Henry, will you stop whining? I have a great deal to do before I leave for the coast. Roger, if I have to get on my knees and beg, I will. But please don't destroy the house. This place is worthless. Victorian houses like this cost too much to maintain. You think of nothing but money. What about my feelings? Your feelings? Yes, and and Mother's, if she were still alive. Oh, Mother would approve, I'm sure of that. How do you know? This is the house Mother came to as a bride. The house where she bore and raised her two sons. This house was her life. Oh, really, Henry? It's true. How can you stand by and watch the room where she used to kiss us goodnight broken to bits by wreckers? Sentimental nonsense. And what about all her silver and furniture? Old and beautiful. You can't put things like that in a modern house. We'll pack them carefully and send them to storage. Yes. Yes, you just pack Mother away and forget her. Look, look here. Her favorite candlesticks. Don't wave that around. It's worth a small fortune. And a wealth of love to me. Where will these go in your fancy new house? All right. Put them under your pillow then, like your baby teeth. I don't care. No. No, you don't, do you, Roger? You don't care one little bit. What are you talking about? Why should you care? You got it all. You're the executor of the estate... Yes, and you've been the executioner of my self-respect. Nonsense. Now, as I said, I have a great deal to do before I leave tomorrow. I hate you, Roger. I hate you. What? I'd like to see you dead. Henry, stop being childish. I'd tear your heart out if you had any. Henry, put down that candlestick. No, they're mothers. And you want to pack mother away. I order you to... But you won't destroy us. You won't put mother's memory in storage. I'll make sure mother isn't hidden. You give me that. No. No. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. I stood dazed. Roger lay on the floor, a trickle of blood oozing from his temple. I bent over him. No breath. No pulse. Roger was dead. Suddenly, I heard a car coming up the drive. Mrs. Loomis, the housekeeper, was returning from the village. I dragged Roger's body to the closet, pushed him inside, and locked the door. Not a moment too soon. 
Mr. Henry, I stopped by the laundry for Mr. Rogers' shirts, but they weren't ready. Oh? He'll be furious, I suppose, seeing he's flying to the coast in the morning. Well, uh, it doesn't matter, Mrs. Loomis. He's already gone. Gone, sir? Uh, yes, he decided to spend the night in New York at the club and go to the airport from there. Well, I never got a chance to say goodbye to him. Perhaps we could go to the airport together. No, and... no, I'll, I'll see him off alone. But I always wish Mr. Roger well before one of his trips. I'll give him your best wishes, Mrs. Lomas. I'd rather you stayed here in the morning. Well, very well, sir. It'll just be you for dinner, then. Oh, don't bother tonight, Mrs. Lomas. Why don't you take the night off for a change? Go to a movie. Why, well, I, I might at that, sir, if it's all right. Of course. Thank you, sir. But I do wish I could have seen Mr. Roger off. I waited in the library until I heard Mrs. Loomis go out. I had to get rid of the body now. I am not one who suffers fools gladly nor accepts much brown nosing. I want talent. I want ability. And I will go to lengths to find it, and I will also go to lengths to put up with it, as sometimes is necessary. All right, but where's the sponsor who will put... Now, get this. Well, I'm talking about 20-year-old figures. Who will put $5,000 into a superb super production. That's all it would cost in radio. There isn't a sponsor in this country but $5,000 a week. He'll put $250,000 into a film. He won't put $5,000 into a radio show. Let him give me the $5,000 and see what happens. You won't get any audience. But those you get will buy your product by the barrel. They'll be so grateful. At 5.05 p.m., indictment signed on, starring Nat Poland and Jack Arthur. Indictment debuted on January 29, 1956. He told stories from the files of former ADA Eliezer Lipsky. The episodes presented the step-by-step -step details that went into gathering evidence which led to an indictment. Indictment, a formal written charge of crime as the basis for trial of the accused. Indictment. The drama you are about to hear is from New York City and is based on stories of the criminal law with authentic procedures as detailed by Eliezer Lipsky, former assistant district attorney of New York. It is the assistant district attorney who directs criminal investigations, assembles facts and witnesses, builds the case to a just indictment. This way, Fatso, through the door. Okay, hold it up. Turn out your pockets. Belt comes off, shoelaces. Put your wallet in the envelope and seal it. Uh, how long do I stay here? Till the day you're sentenced. You pick up your stuff when you go up the river. All right, go ahead, lick the envelope. Yeah, I could use a drink. There's water in your cell. All right, this way. Okay, watch the door. In you go. Okay, fatso. You can draw against the money in the envelope once a day for cigarettes, candy bars, and postage stamps. Have fun. Yeah, legal aid. I could have done better if I tried my own case. What was your rap, huh? I swear I didn't see you up there. I always liked uppers. What was your rap? What was yours? <laughs> Same as usual, make them book. Yeah. Attempt at extortion. I had a good thing going on a trash handling racket. Move in on new stores around the housing projects. But I had to go and pick on an ex-marine. Oh, I'll get a year. Won't kill me. Oh, no. What's with the oh, no? They got a new gimmick now. Indeterminate sentencing. 
Indeterminate? What's that? Indeterminate. That's up the tree. They can keep me up there for three years for a lousy attempted extortion? Three solid, but uh, with good time, maybe. Oh, no. They don't give me no lousy three years. Uh, who was the uh, DA with your case? I don't know. McCormick, something like that. Yeah, yeah, McCormick. Why? If I was you, I'd holler for him. Why? I hear he's pretty square. Yeah, like a neg. The day I see a square assistant DA. Now, this one I hear is very square. If you was to holler for him and say you want to help yourself, he'll listen. Rat? Rat for the DA? Come on. What you do is up to you. I'm only saying, if you want to help yourself and try and buy a lower sentence, McCormick will listen. The point is, you got to come through. you got to give him something. Are you stolen for him? Would I be here waiting for a ride upstate if I was a pigeon? You can help yourself with McCormick. Think. Think of a job you can give him where there was only you and one other guy. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Give him everything, everything. A whole confession. And he sends me up on that, sure. Nah, the beauty part of it is he can't touch you on your testimony. Also, he can't touch you on the other guys. He can't touch him because he can't convict on the testimony of co-conspirators. So that way... All right, all right, just one thing. Yeah? If you're such a good jailhouse lawyer, how come you're going up the river for a lousy bookmaking pinch? Oh, that. Yeah, that. Well, uh, the thing is, making book was the pinch. What the wanted was for murder, too. So uh, when you talk to McCormick, don't mention my name. Get the picture. And we do mean motion picture. This is your chance to attend school within your assigned area. How? by enrolling in a USAFI telecourse. If you are taking a USAFI correspondence course, you may also be able to attend a classroom on film, which will give you additional instruction on the same subject. Although primarily prepared for showing in areas which are serviced by armed forces television, these telecourses can also be shown in any other area which has a standard 16 millimeter projector. The filmed courses each come in a series of from 12 to 20 half-hour films and are conducted by well-qualified high school and college teachers. At the present time, the number of courses is limited. So if you are interested in studying by this method, see your education officer for information and details. Then enroll with USAFI and let a telecourse be your guide. Smith, what's your problem? Mr. McCormick, I want to help myself. What do you mean by that? Well, I want to try and buy a lower sentence. (laughs) Who's been talking to you in there? They put him in the same cell with Billy the Bull, Mr. McCormick. Oh, uh, great advice you must have got from a punk who's going to end up in the chair one of these fine days. What do you mean, a lower sentence? How do you know what sentence you're going to draw? I hear about this indeterminate sentence thing you got going now. It means three years, right? It means up to three years. Am I up for that deal? It's up to the court. Look, figure it out. Your yellow sheet shows two dozen arrests in the past 15 years and only two convictions. You're long overdue for a stretch. Mr. McCormick, I heard you was fair and square. I heard you'd listen to a man. Well, I'm listening, I'm listening. You say you want to help yourself. Go ahead. Mr. McCormick, I want to help you. I want to give you a good case. Oh, I don't know. Putting you away has improved my morale considerably. Huh? Never mind, never mind. Okay, you asked me to listen, I'm listening. You got to promise me something first. Mr. McCormick can't make any deal, Smith. I'm trying to say I want to make a confession, but all I ask is you don't use it against me. Are you going to give me somebody else? Is that it? Mr. McCormick, you can send me up a tree, and what do you got? A lousy little attempt at extortion. Dirtiest shakedown racket in years is what it is. That Marine should have beat you to a pulp. Mr. McCormick, do I have to take this from that detective? I give you something, otherwise you got no lead on it at all. (laughs) Come to the point. What I'm trying to say is, I can hand you a good robbery case. Grand larceny, the whole story, names, places. You can close the book on it. If you let me tell you... Let me tell you something, Smith. I have you where I want you. 
On your way to three well-deserved years in the can. I don't have to make any deals with you. And don't worry, I'll listen to your story. I won't use it against you, but I'm warning you in advance. A, it has to be good info. B, it has to lead to an indictment and conviction. And C, get this through your bullet head, even then, the best I can do for you is inform the court that you've been cooperative with this office. And that is as far as I can or will go to help you. Have you got that? Mr. McCormick, that's all I ask. A word to the judges and they'll know what to do. That's all I ask. They told me you were fair and square and I trust you. All right, all right. What robbery? Where? When? Uh, 1953. Easter Sunday. Consolidated furs. The warehouse over where they built the new terminal, right? Detective Russo? He's right, Mr. McCormick. I was on safe and lofts then. We never broke it. Let me ask you this, big man. What was the haul? That curly black fur, those little, like, goats. Curly, uh, caracule? Caracule, yeah. And a whole mess of them stripy little things, like chipmunks. Barra, barra... Baron Ducci? Baron Ducci, right. Six mutation mink, which, by the way, we couldn't unload. They was kind of rare in those days. How much did it come to? What it come to on our end, 5,000 apiece. But for sure, the whole lot was 100 grand in goods. He's on the beam, Mr. McCormick. Records will bear him out. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, there was a whole series of holiday jobs back then. Uh, I'm giving you just this one. Who was in on it? One, there was Eddie Cannon from Chicago. He cased it, worked out the plan, furnished the truck and the guns. And Danny Doby, he drove. Detective Russo, check out those names. Yes. Huh? Uh, wait a minute. I ain't finished yet. There was an eyewitness. He wouldn't give you nothing, but I'm telling you, he caught a glimpse. The parking you sent it where Cannon sold the truck. No, oh, no, you don't catch me. I'm giving you the straight story. It was the watchman, and you know it was the watchman. Checks, Mr. McCormick. I must have thrown the fear of death into the old man. He developed the worst case of sudden amnesia we ever ran into. Yeah. Anything else? That's the story. You can check it, and it's all there. I honestly want to help myself, Mr. McCormick. One year, all right, with time off, I'm in good shape. But after all, I'm an old man, Mr. McCormick. I'm in trouble if I got to go up for three years. And I swear, Mr. McCormick, if I get this break, I'm keeping my nose clean. Uh, wait a minute, Detective Russo. I can save you some work. I can tell you where to find Doby right now. That'll be a help. He's still driving. That was the whole point. He was a legitimate driver. He could handle anything. Pick up trucks, tractor and trailer, anything. Uh, where would I find him? The Union. The Union would know. Bring him in, Detective Russo. Yes, sir. All right, Smith. The whole thing all over again from the top. Everything you can remember. Am I doing all right, Mr. McCormick? Am I doing the right thing? Am I helping myself? You heard me. Take it from the top. The rest is up to the court. But you're not going to use it against me. That's the understanding. Smith, I'm bound by law not to use this statement against you. Any prosecutor who gets a confession by making a promise not to use it is bound by law. I wouldn't use it even if there weren't a law that said I couldn't. Mr. McCormick, they were right. I guess I did the right thing. Special Bureau, Russo. This is Chicago ID. On that request this morning, Eddie Cannon, you asked for that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, where is he? Well, his body's buried out back at Joliet. He was killed in a prison riot last year. Anything else you want to know? No, that's all. Thanks. You betcha. Mr. Kernikin, uh, try and remember The warehouse It was robbed, don't you remember? That you, Frankie? Why don't you ever come to see me, Frankie? Mr. Kernikin, I'm not Frankie I'm a detective The fur robbery Mr. Kernikin, think It was only five years ago Easter Sunday, two men robbed the warehouse Yeah, uh, but radio was such a clean business compared to the rest of show business. There were talented people in radio who got along on their talent, not because they were related to somebody, not because they had something on somebody, not because they could knife somebody in the back. It was the clean end of show business. Elia Kazan, I used to have him on Crime Doctor, I guess it was, quite frequently, and we'd walk from CBS to uh, Grand Central Station after the show, after the broadcast. And Gadget said more than once that to him, good radio was far more difficult than any of the other media. Now, he'd been born and brought up behind the scenes in the theater, was not only an accomplished actor, but a good director, too. But he felt that partly because of the limitations of rehearsal, 
it took more talent to do radio well than any of the other media. That was the voice of director and writer Jack Johnstone. In September of 1957, he was in his third year directing Bob Bailey and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bob Bailey's daughter, Roberta Bailey Goodwin. Why, it is painful. It, those were very good times. And like I say, afterwards, when radio died, and I mean it died with a big bang, it just died out there in California. They tried to move it back to New York, and when they tried to convert to TV, so many of the radio personalities couldn't make the conversion. And until other jobs opened up, like the sponsor jobs, there were a lot of radio stars that just went completely downhill. Especially, like my father, had nothing to fall back on. He'd been an actor all his life. And by the time his radio show was over, he was almost 50. He weighed about 150 pounds, stood about five foot nine and a half, and they looked at him on television and said, you're not Johnny Dollar. And he said, but I am, I've been. And they said, no, no, we have to get a six foot tall guy that weighs about 200 pounds to play the part. It was sad. It was a very sad time when TV just wiped it out. There was a prejudice against uh, radio actors on the part of television producers. When they came in, what I've read, at least, is that a lot of them were young whiz kids who came along and had a new toy, and they said, no, 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 if you worked in radio now, you've got your own way of doing things, and this is TV. And actually, when you think that working in radio would give you a credential, back in the early 50s, it actually worked against you. It did, because if you think of it, radio is an entirely different form of acting. You relied completely on the sound man, the sound mixer, for any sound effects that needed to be put in. Although you stood in front of the microphone, you would move your arms occasionally and act a little. All the acting was in the voice, in what came out from inside of you. You could wheel someone up there in a wheelchair, and he would project over the radio his voice, his emotion. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Peter Hardy at Tri-Western Property and Casualty Insurance. Hi, how are things in the Golden West? You still in Reno? Sure am. Good boy. What goes, Pete? A little trouble with a big dairy farm out here, Johnny. A menian dairy. Okay, Pete, tell me all. A year and a half ago in a fire, a menian lost one of his silos. You know, one of those big towers where they store and cure a lot of chopped up corn and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. Cost us $21,000. 21000 for a silo? This time it's a compound silo, and the claim is for 56000 Oh! But I don't want to pay it. I don't blame you. Sure, because, Johnny, I think it was arson. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, Act One of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri Western Property and Casualty Insurance Company, Reno, Nevada office. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the doubtful dairy matter. Expense account item one, 14120. Transportation and incidentals, Hartford to Reno, Nevada. It was about 9 a.m. when I arrived, so I checked into the Mapes Hotel, then walked over to Pete Hardy's office. Armenian Dairies is just north of here, Johnny, in Warm Springs Valley off Route 33. Well, then I'd better rent me a car. Or you can use mine. Now, now, Pete, how can I run up my expense account unless I have something to run it up with? Johnny, for once. T- uh uh-uh. uh. Anyhow, the reason why these silos Amenian has are so expensive... Is that the owner's name, by the way? Yes, Aram Amenian. And I take it he's Armenian? Strangely enough, no. Now, he's had all his silos very specially built. Oh, how specially can you build a silo? Just a concrete base, a lot of long wooden staves to get the circular shape, and a good roof on top. Well, he has some trick with them inside. Like what? That's his deep, dark secret. But he claims it makes better silage for his cattle than is possible anywhere else in the world. And one of these things burned up a year and a half ago. The word exploded best describes it. Yeah. And as I said, cost us 21000 And now the replacement has gone up in flames. Right? Yes, day before yesterday. He filed a claim the same day. Well, why do you suspect arson? Did the local authorities find anything suspicious? No. But you go out and talk with Amenian, Johnny. 
And if you don't end up with the same kind of feeling I have, well, I'll leave my shirt. Expense account item two, fifty dollars deposit on a drive your own car. Finding the Amenian Dairy and Ranch some twenty miles north of the city was easy. It was spread out all over the countryside. Hundreds of acres of well irrigated lush green pastures. Square in the middle of the ranch sat one of the cleanest, most modern dairies I ever saw. Aram Amenian gave me the grand tour, and I must say I was impressed. There was close to two hundred well kept Guernseys in the main barn, which was clean as a whistle. The milking machines, coolers, separators, clarifiers, and so on were the same. Yep. A prosperous-looking setup. Finally, Mr. Amenian took me out to where a small group of workmen were cleaning up what was left of his compound silo. As you can see, Mr. Dollar, only the concrete base is left. That must have been a pretty big silo, Mr. Amenian. That's the largest and most efficient in the entire West. Still, $56,000. Oh, the size had nothing to do with that. It was the inner construction, known only to Barnwell, the man who built it for me, and to myself, of course. Well, what was so special about it? Principally a method of venting. Venting? Yes. It increases the phosphorus and lactic acid content. Well, I thought the point in the silo was to keep it pretty well sealed up. Venting within, Mr. Dollar. But that's all I'll tell you about it. It cost me 56000 to have Barnwell build it. And I wish the company to pay my claim as quickly as possible. Because I'm starting construction on a new one immediately. Of the same type? Oh, the vastly improved type. Oh, then it was to your advantage to lose the old one. Just what do you mean by that? Your loss came at just the right time, didn't it? Not just a minute, Dollar. With the insurance money, you can build a new and better one. And when it gets out of date, I suppose you'll have another fire. Oh, I see. You, uh, you think perhaps these last two were deliberately set? Were they? Ridiculous. Is it? But if they were... Yeah. If they were, I, I certainly wouldn't know it. Oh, come on now. After what you've just said... And what's more, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure you'll never be able to prove it. Two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. We sometimes wonder, what is the life of a human being really worth? Not too much? Or maybe a great deal? Does it depend on whose life it is? Whatever the answer, one thing is certain. Fred Hargesheimer, since World War II, has felt that his life is worth quite a lot. Quite a lot of gratitude. During the war in the Pacific, about June of 1943... Lieutenant Hargesheimer had his P-38 fighter plane shot out of the sky. Badly wounded, he bailed out over a tiny island, New Britain. It looked pretty small from where he hit the silk, but he found it much bigger when he hit the ground. It was bigger, and in complete control of the enemy. But Hargesheimer was lucky. After a month of lonely hiding, he was found by a group of friendly natives from the village of Nantambu. They cared for him and successfully hid him from enemy patrols for the next four months at the risk of their own lives. Then Hargesheimer was able to make it back to civilization. For the next 17 years, Fred Hargesheimer thought about those wonderful people of Nantambu. 12,000 miles away in the United States of America, Hargesheimer put a great plan into effect. He made speeches, took up collections, sold jewelry belonging to his family and worked out a way to bring a bit of civilization and happiness to the little village of Nantambu. Needless to say, the villagers gave him a spectacular welcome upon his return. Fred Hargesheimer showed his gratitude to the people who had saved his life. But life is worth little without freedom. The right of all men. Everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Doubtful Dairy Matter. By what he said and the way he said it, Aram Amenian was practically challenging me to find out how arson was involved in the destruction of his $56,000 secretly constructed compound silo. Expense account item three phone call from a gas station on Highway 33 to Reno Police Headquarters. But Lieutenant Brady of the arson squad assured me he'd failed to find anything indicating the fire was set. So dead end. Until I remembered a little trick that had worked for me before and might work again. Item four twenty-seven cents for a loaf of white bread at a grocery store along the highway. Then I drove back to the Amenian Ranch. 
If I'd known you were hungry, Mr. Dollar, I should have had something provided for you at the ranch house, in spite of your rather nasty attitude about this loss of mine. Food is the last thing I'm thinking of, Mr. Armenian. Well, then why this loaf of bread, if you're not... Whoop. Now, uh, let's see. Oh, now, surely you're not going to eat the piece that dropped in the ashes. No. Nope. No. Well, then get it out of your mouth, man. Well, no. mm-hmm. Whatever in the world are you doing, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Yeah, I knew it. You knew what? A sure, a sure test for kerosene, Mr. Armenian. What? Yeah, fresh bread dropped in the ashes of a fire even days after the fire is out. I don't understand. I can still taste the kerosene. And, mister, it makes things look pretty bad for you. Me? Oh, good heavens, man, you can't... Dollar, I resent this, this completely unfounded accusation. Go right ahead and resent. Or better still, let me get hold of a stenographer and you can dictate a confession. Get out of here. Want to do it the hard way, huh? Get off this ranch, Dollar. Now leave. Immediately. Sure. And I warn you, don't come back. Because if you do... Better be careful, Mr. Armenian. The kind of a threat you're about to make wouldn't sound very good in court. Get out. Get out! Out on the highway, I stopped at the mobile gas station again and made another phone call. Item five, another 20 cents. It was to my old friend, Herb Carlbert, cashier of Reno's Farm Trade National Bank. It was fast closing time, but he promised to leave a door open for me. So I grabbed a sandwich and a Coke along the way. That's item six, 80 cents, including tip. Then at the bank, Herb led me back to his private office. Well, oh, sit down, Johnny. Tell me all about yourself. Yeah, later, Herb. We'll go out on the town and talk our heads off. Right now, I need some information. I hope you can tell me where to get it. Oh? Information about what? The Armenian Dairy. Or better still, Armenian himself. You know him? Oh, I certainly do. We're his bank. His happens to be one of the best accounts we have, especially in our investment department. You mean it's big? <laughs> Funny big. Like how much? Well, now, Johnny. I'll tell you this. If I had a quarter of his net worth... I'd have retired long ago. No big outstanding debts on his place? Anything like that? Not a penny. Aram's financial condition is his... Now, wait a minute. Yeah? That fire and explosion of his compound silo? Yeah, that's right. Herb, I've found evidence indicating our... Well, certainly aren't accusing him. Who else? Oh, no, 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 you're wrong. Oh, now, look, Herb, he filed that claim so fast. It's the most natural thing in the world for him. It's the way he does everything, like paying his bills immediately on receipt. He works that way. You expect everybody else to? Well, he gave me the impression he wanted to collect quickly in order to have money for rebuilding. Of course. Rather than cash in some of his blue chip investments. Herb, somebody fired that silo. Well, it certainly wouldn't be Aaron. Ah, you sound like you're in cahoots with him. <laughs> what about his employees? From my impression of the man... They seemed... love him like a father. Every one of them. And if every employer was as generous as he is, there wouldn't be any labor troubles in this country. Well, the fact remains that somebody somehow stood to profit by destroying that silo. And the one before it. Well, I can't imagine who. Even his competitors like and respect the man. Oh, so they say. No, 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 they do. He's helped them stay on their feet during hard times, develop new ideas and methods, then pass them on to them. Oh, the fact remains... Well, Johnny... Johnny, I've had a rough day. How about a nice, cool, casual drink? Then we'll have dinner and take in the town. Item 7, 2130, for drinks and a good dinner back at the Mapes. But I didn't enjoy either. Because Herb and his defense of a median was no help at all. Except perhaps for giving me a list of all the people he could think of who did business with him. I decided to check them all first thing in the morning. Finally, about midnight, having lost our share at a couple of nearby gambling clubs, we parted. Herb drove away to his home on the outskirts of town. I went back to the Mapes. Uh, take Mr. and Mrs. Kenworthy to room 314, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What can... Oh, Mr. Dolly. Uh, oh, just my key, please. Certainly, sir. Here you are, sir. And I hope you enjoy a pleasant night's rest. Thanks. Oh, by the way, there was a gentleman here looking for you early this evening. Uh, hung around quite a while. Said he'd be back. Well, who was he? He didn't give his name, sir, nor did he wish to leave a message. Mr. Amenian? Mr. Amenian the dairyman? Oh, no, sir. I'm quite sure. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? There he is. There. Huh? Going out the door, the dark brown coat. You're sure? Yes, sir. The same man. I wonder. Yeah, so do I. But, but if he knows you, sir, and saw you, sir. By the time I got out the front door, the man in the brown coat was halfway down the block and walking fast. Faster and faster, as a matter of fact, as I gained on him. 
He turned the corner, and by this time, both of us were running. Hey! Hey! Were you looking for me? By the end of three or four blocks, it was a real foot race. Then suddenly he turned into an alley, and like a darn fool, I plunged into the darkness of it after him. Hey! Hey! Right here! Oh, no, you... Bob was a fine, fine fellow. No question about it. Uh, incidentally, he wrote one script. He got an idea for, as I recall, a Christmas story one time mm. and asked if he might write a script. Well, that was fine by me. <laughs> so uh, during the Johnny Dollar days, which we recorded out here in Hollywood, Bob McKenney for a long time was my engineer. Excellent engineer. Do you know Bob? Mm. We did not edit those tapes. We recorded the show just as though they were live. A few actors resented this in the very beginning, but most of them got to like it because it got much, much better performances. If we got a third of the way through a program and somebody fluffed, we went back to the beginning, started all over again. But as I say, it got good performances because everybody was on his toes. As a result, we had no editing problems on the Johnny Dollar show. Charlie Bayer was featured in this cast. I know Jack Johnstone. He never went in the booth. He directed as they did 400 years ago. He'd put earphones on at his own booth and stood right in the studio with you, which most of us found <laughs> extremely annoying. He was a very affable man, but I said, gosh, hey, your credit should be directed and conducted by, because he, <laughs> he'd wave and point and whatnot, and he insisted on certain weird techniques that after a while you rebel that but if you wanted to work you did it yeah. <laughs> after the fbi and peace and war went on at 605 gunsmoke signed on bayer had been part of the cast since its first broadcast in 1952. by that time we were recorded ahead and we were all very grateful that we had enough shows recorded in the can, so to speak, that we did not know when we were doing our last one. I don't think it would have been a very enjoyable day for us to go in there knowing that this was it. It was kind of close. I missed five out of about 530, as a lot of shows have done now. I think we entered areas that Westerns, indeed the radio shows, had not entered before. There was a little of the psychological involved and there were instances where sometimes right did not triumph mm -hmm. as in the real world. And the thing about Gunsmoke, it became a labor of love for all of us. I know I still have a big library of Western fact and fiction mm -hmm. of that era. We were a pretty intact group there. We had the same director, the same assistant director, the same script girl, the same engineer, the same sound crew. The music was the same, and uh, in addition to the four regulars, there probably were not more than 20 or 25 people mm -hmm. that were used. It formed a pretty tight nucleus, a stock company, as it were, for that and the show. If we had been given just an outline, I think that Bill and Howard and Georgia and I and some of the regulars, I think we could have ad-libbed a show if... if it was that mm -hmm. tight and that close? Yeah. You were so we got close to know to each it. other's uh -huh. timing so well mm -hmm. and anticipate each other's thoughts. I, I remember little things like, well, Dylan had told Chester to put some wood on the fire and the sound of the logs going on there. And I went, <coughs> He said, well, get out of the smoke. <laughs> Just as an ad lib, huh? Uh, green. Uh -huh. he said, you should have got dry. And then we went on with whatever <laughs> we were doing. And things like that. By 1957, Gunsmoke was, quite simply, one of the most influential westerns in history. Norman MacDonald was its director. When Gunsmoke went on the air in uh, April of 52, it was really the only one of its kind. In the years that followed, I think there were a good many imitators, uh, some very successful and some just poor imitations. It had always been a rule of thumb in radio that 
there should not be any dead air, that people must keep talking. Well, we changed that, not because we deliberately set out to change it, but just because the people we were working with didn't talk all the time. So we had to fill it with sound patterns. We had three sound men for the most part, Bill James, Tom Hanley, Ray Kemper, who contributed more to the show than anybody could ever imagine. For example, the boys on their own time realized that we were having trouble with live gunshots. They, on a Saturday, went out with some equipment of their own and recorded shots on tape with a 45 and with a 38 and with a 32 and I think with a 22. These effects then could be played directly through the line so that it didn't flatten out and become just a, a dull pop. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gun smoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. And the story of a man who moved with it. I'm that man. Matt Dillon, the United States Marshal. The first man they look for and the last they want to meet. It's a chancy job. And it makes a man watchful. And a little lonely. saddle, Mr. Dillon. I swear I'm so hungry I could eat a whole hog. Yeah, but with all the hog you got this morning's cooking on that stick right there, Chester. Is it done? Well, it depends on how hungry you are. It's done. <laughs> Thank you. E -e -e. <laughs> That's hot, ain't it? <laughs> it sure will be good to get back to Dodd tonight and sleep in the bed again, won't it? You know something, Chester? Civilization's made you soft. Well, maybe so. But I get mighty tired of using my back for a mattress and my belly for a covering. <laughs> Obviously, you were born for greater things than rooting around on the prairie and living in the rain. It ain't been raining, Mr. Jones. Uh, no, no, it hasn't, Chester. But it will. Sooner or later, it's bound to rain. Yes, sir. Wish we'd brought some more bacon. Say, Mr. Dillon, don't old man Granby live around here somewhere? Uh-huh. Well, maybe we could buy a little from him. According to what I've always heard, old Granby wouldn't lend anybody anything. Yeah. You really think he is a rich miser, like they say? Oh, I don't know, Chester. You know, sometimes a man's entirely different from his reputation. I only met Granby once or twice. He seemed like a nice enough old fellow. Mm. It's the same. I wouldn't want to live out here all alone with nothing but a few horses for company. Yeah, well, he's used to it. Yeah, but even if he does have a lot of money hid away somewhere, there's no place to spend it out here. Granby's pretty old for the pleasures Dodge has to offer, Chester. Oh, my gee, I hope I ain't never that old. <laughs> you know, at the rate you're burning yourself out, you never will be, so don't worry about it. Uh, Mr. Dillon, I live mighty quiet for a young fella who's... Free and still full of blood and stuff? Sure. Oh, I do. Uh, look over yonder. Huh? Over there, that string of dust laying right on the ground there. Ain't that funny? Yeah, I've been watching that. Not on the ground, though. There's a dry wash that runs along there. I think somebody's driving the stock down it. Mm. Maybe it's old man Granby. Yeah, maybe. Why don't we go over and say hello, huh? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Dillon? Yeah. If it is, old man Granby, maybe we might could just ask him by a little dab of bacon, reckon? Well, 
There's no harm in that. Oh. That looks like horses down there. Yes, sir. I can see their heads now. But I don't see nobody driving them. They belong in a minute. Now, let's wait here. Yonder he comes. Now, that's not old Granby. Well, let's ride down and say hello anyway. That's Granby's brand on those horses. You must have hired him a hand. Yeah, maybe. Hello. Hello. You working for Granby? I ain't working for nobody, mister. Oh? No? And where is he? Where is who? Granby. I don't know no Granby. Those are his horses you're driving. They are? Yeah. I ain't driving them. What do you mean? They got ahead of me in the wash there, that's all. Oh, I see. You a cowboy? Yeah, sure. I'm a cowboy. Somehow you don't look like one. You don't ride like one, either. You're asking the questions, mister. And no decent cowboy would run another man's horses down a dry wash just because he didn't want to get up on the bank and ride around them. I told you, they got in front of me, is all. How come you're not carrying a gun? Does a man have to carry a gun? No. But I'll bet you're the only man within a thousand miles of here who isn't carrying one. Well, maybe I got a better conscience than the rest of you. Maybe. But look, mister, you've run those horses about five miles off of old Granby's place. You want to give us a hand, we'll run them back. I'm in a hurry. It won't take long. The old man might be a couple of days fighting them if we don't. You worry about him. I got to get into Dodge. We'll ride in with you afterwards. I ain't going to do it. It'd look a lot better if you did. I, um... I'd like to, mister, but I can't. I'm leaving now. So long. Well, forevermore, Mr. Dillon, you just gonna let him go? Wait a minute, Chester. I'm gonna let him hear what lead sounds like. Don't shoot! Don't shoot me! All right, then ride back here. Don't kill me, mister. I'm not going to kill you. Unless you try to run away. Why would I try to run away? You just did, Chester. Yes, sir? Ride down the bank and head those horses off. Start them back up the watch. We'll be out of here by the time they're back. All right, sir, Mr. Dillon. You stay right close to me, fellow. Don't you try anything smart. When we get to Granby's, if he says it's okay, then you can go wherever you like. I don't know Granby. I've never been there. And we'll show you the way. Come on, let's go. Another visit with Joe and Daphne Forsythe. Joe. Joe. Joe, stop reading that paper and talk to me. I'm listening. Go ahead. Well, I was talking to Mrs. Snyder today. You know, she's the one whose boy had 31% less cavities. Uh-huh. Well, she thinks that we should buy bigger savings bonds. Uh-huh. She says that when people can afford it, it makes more sense. Oh, she says there are a lot of different denominations. They start at $25, but then there are a 50, 100, 200, and even $500 bonds. Is that so? And then with the ones we've already bought through the payroll savings plan, we'd have quite a nest egg. Uh-huh. Are you listening to me? Uh-huh. Did you know that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and a third percent of the original purchasing price? Uh-huh. I thought so. Joe, what did I say? Uh, you said that United States savings bonds are a safe, easy way of investing. I did. That they help guard our country's freedom. And? They're the best investment in America's future. 
I said something else, too. Oh, yeah. You said that the total accumulated compounded semi-annual interest of the Series E savings bond will amount to 93 and one-third percent of the original purchase price. Well, now, how did you do that? Husband's trade secret. Oh, man, Granby sure can find his horses all right now, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, but I want this cowboy here to meet him. Now we'll see if he's in the house. I'll wait for you. Get off a horse, fellow. Go on. That's better. All right, come on. We'll take a look. Well, what are you waiting for? Nothing. You go ahead, Chess. It looks like I'm going to have to herd this man in. Yes, sir. You've been kind of balky ever since we ran into you, haven't you? I just don't like being dragged around. I never did. Well, I just want you to meet old Granby. He'll be grateful for your help and run his horses back here. I know what you think, mister. You think I was stealing them horses. Well, I never heard of the old man. I was never near this place. So you told me, but you're here now. I ain't afraid of you or nobody. Now let's go into the house. Come on. Yeah, what is it, Chester? Oh, oh, Granby, he, he's in there. Oh, what's wrong? Right in the room there, Mr. Jones. He, he just hang in there. What? Somebody went and hung him right in his own house. I don't want to see him no more. You you go take a look at him. Pull your gun and hold it on this man, Chester. If he makes some move, shoot him. Yes, sir. Now, you just stand right there real quiet like. I ain't going to do nothing. You sure ain't. Just because I happen to be in the country don't mean I killed nobody. Yeah. Mr. Dillon will decide about that. Who is this Mr. Dillon, anyway? He's a United States Marshal. That's who he is. Uh, a Marshal? A Marshal. Looks like you run into the wrong people, fella. Here, I'll hold your gun, Chester, and you'll search him. All right, sir. Here. Turn around. All right, take it easy. Now, the house is all torn up. He must have been looking for old Granby's money. I was never in that house. There ain't nothing on him. Not a thing. All right, Chester. Here's your gun. There, gotcha. Thank you. What's your name, fellow? Trimble. Joe Trimble. Where are you from? Up north. Up north where? All over. What are you doing down here? Making a change. Sure. And some cowboy you ran into told you about Granby being rich. So you came here and you kicked the old man around and then you hung him and you tried to find the money. That's a lie. This is the first time I was ever near the place. I'm sure you did it, Trimble, but I wish I had more evidence. The court of law just might not convict you the way things stand. You gonna let me go? No, I'm not gonna let you go. I'm arresting you and you're gonna stand trial and I'm gonna do my best to see you hung. I didn't do it, I tell you. And I'll go free, too. You'll see. Now, there's something mighty wrong about you, Trimble, and I can't figure it at all. But I'm sure going to find out. It seems to me that in the old days of radio, and I'm going back again to the 40s and 50s, the executives, whether men like Guy Della Chapa or Harry Ackerman or whomever, were men with an experience in and a feeling for the theatrical end of the business as opposed to the business end of radio. There was a wonderful meeting of the minds when you went in and said you wanted to do such and such a kind of show. They could, they could picture and understand and either agree or disagree with what you had in mind, but they knew what you were talking about. It was really extraordinarily easy to get a conference or a meeting with the uh, then-CBS brass, 
Usually it was one man or two men, and that one man or those two men said yes or no to your idea, and you either went with it or didn't. There was no feeling of committee and that somebody upstairs would say yes or no. Can you identify this voice? As office boy, I made such a mark that they gave me the post of a junior clerk. I served the writs with a smile so bland, copied all the letters in a big round hat. In the next half hour, you will hear the voices of some of the world's best-known personalities on radio's newest, most exciting fun game, Says Who? <laughs> Yes, it's time for Says Who. And here's the star of Says Who, a man who defies the elements and practically everybody else, Henry Morgan. Says Who debuted alongside the Stan Freeberg Show on Sunday, July 14, 1957, as part of a week in which CBS Radio added $765,000 in new billings. Says Who would be sponsored every other week by Look Magazine. I tell you, there's one thing I admire, it's optimism. Thank you very kindly for yours. We have an interesting panel ready to play Says Who, but before I introduce them to you, let's listen to this message. Did you fill up the gas tank of my swept wing Dodge? Yes, I did. That'll be 80 cents. She didn't need no oil or nothing. Okay, wipe off the windshield, will you? Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is some big windshield, boy. Yes, it's a Dodge picture window windshield. I can't reach the middle part, right up there where it curves back. Hold my ankles and boost me out on the hood. All right. Up uh, you go. My, this is a big car. I still can't reach all the winds here. Well, just walk out on the hood and finish it up. Okay. Boy, you must be rich to own a big car like this. Well, actually, Dodge costs less than 59 different models of the low price field. I just got all the car I was paying for. I forgot my squeegee. Here it is. Why, I could afford a Dodge. Come on, we'll see a Dodge dealer. Well, put up to the pump and I'll swing down. Now let's meet our panel. An optimistic little group. First, uh, Mr. Joey Adams. Well, Mr. Henry Morgan. Nice, yes, nice to have you aboard. And, uh, Dagmar. Hello, everybody. Lovely to have you aboard. Thank you. Mr. Orson Bean. Let's squeeze the whole show into 20 minutes, Henry. I'm working as fast as I can. Next to Mr. Bean is Hermione Gingold. Yes. <laughs> Can't go any faster than that. That's our panel. <laughs> panel, I know you know the rules. We play a voice which you try to identify. The listener suggesting the voice gets $15. If you don't come up with the right answer, the listener gets an additional $15. You have the voice texts on cards in front of you. Let's play Says Who. Panel, the first voice was suggested by Mr. Jim Goodrich of Carmichael, California. La, 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 la. la, la, la. the identification of that voice, please. Few people know that this glamorous movie star can sing. You were listening to the voice of Ava Gardner. Ooh. <laughs> oh. 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 Shall we play uh, 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 a bit folks? of says who? <laughs> Joey Adams, let's start with who. Uh, la -da -dee, la -da -da. What language is that? Uh, that's just known as lyrics. Those are no lyrics. But and if they are lyrics, would I know who they are if I had the lyric? Joey, on my piece of paper, does not say whether she is singing or not. I have what you have, la da da da, and we go to uh, Dagmar da da. Is she about my size? Well, honey, uh, <laughs> you mean up and down? Well, any way you want to look at it. I mean, uh, is she as tall as I am, or no. as uh, no, this is as tall same. as Joey? About Joey's size. <laughs> does she know Xavier Cougat? Now, how would I know a thing like that? <laughs> oh, I see what you're getting at. No. She wouldn't. Uh, is she in show business? Yes. Is she a singer? No. That's what I figured. Who is it, folks? <laughs> <laughs> they saw the card. Well, let's see. Is she um, fat? No, dear. Is she thin? She's uh, nicely done. <laughs> and we go to Orson Bean. 
Is she as anything as Dagmar? Yes. Oh, I have a clue. Let's see, does she know Ricardo Montalban? He's all right with me. I do not know who she knows. <laughs> you don't know whether or not she knows Xavier Cougart, though. I know. She doesn't know Xavier Cougart. This lady is not primarily a recording star. She is not. Is this lady primarily a film star? She is so. She sings good, Henry. For a film star, yeah. Yeah. She might record. If I had a small company, I might throw her a number or two, you know, see how it went. Why don't you get in touch with her after we find out who it is? I wouldn't want to go for much money, but I figure if we could make one cheap enough. Well, while you're a uh, <laughs> mercenary in the record death, business, let's go to Hermione Gingo. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. You're very amiable this, this evening. This, uh, la di da da etc. it says here, <laughs> is that the actual lyric, or is it because she has forgotten what the lyric is <laughs> and is ad-libbing? As a matter of fact, uh, this girl had it on cue cards, as I recall. <laughs> Is she a, a, a great star in films? She makes a lot of money. Uh, and uh, Oh, has she been in the news a lot lately? No more than usual. And we go I to... I think I know who it is, but you can guess. <laughs> Whisper to me, honey, I'll Miss tell. Gingold hit Mr. Bean, whose turn it isn't. It's I'm going to hit Dagwood here, a Dagmar. <laughs> what, I look like a sandwich, honey? I would like to sandwich, say, folks. I would like to say that this, this is the first time, if there's a first time in history, that this lady has been mistaken for a sandwich. Thank you. Joey? Now, let, let, let's recapitulate. Oh, oh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. I'm game. Now, let want. me see. She doesn't know Ricardo Montalbatten and uh, <laughs> Xavier Cougat, right? She's built like me. Oh, oh hardly. Oh. Well, that's oh. what you said, uh, Dagmar said, is she like her or like me? And no. you said more like me. Just in height. Just, Just in, height. in height? Oh, yes. How about in depth? In depth, she's got it all over you, kid. <laughs> I have an answer that can turn this place into a garage right now. There's <laughs> a girl on, on the screen that has not been in the news lately. She doesn't know Montalbatten or Cougat. <laughs> and she's uh, about my height you know, if, in, in we length. Have... If but we, different in width, right? If we had the time, I'd like to discuss this mountain battle with you. <laughs> well, ding dong, uh, the question's dead. With all those clues from Joey, I think I know the answer, but you tell it. You got a, you got a hope? No. You've lost anyway. All right, you Because we're going to send $30 to Jim Goodrich in Carmichael, California. That was Ava Gardner. Uh, really? Yes, and uh, now you know. She's much shorter than me. Joey, I've never seen her in the flesh. <laughs> She's always in Europe, that's why. Well, I've never I, seen her in Europe either. I had a oh. dream that I was going with Ava Gardner, but it turned out to be a lousy... Gunsmoke started on the air in 52, as we've mentioned, and network radio was beginning to die just at the time we were starting. I guess what I mean is that in those early days, if you were doing a... Uh, a series, and the series was canceled, something else popped up, and you were told to start preparing for a show called Such and Such, which would go on the air next Tuesday. There was always something to replace the show that went off the air. By the end of the 50s, and certainly by the 60s, when a show went off the air, that was just the end of that half hour, or that hour, or that two-hour segment, and it was filled with something else. And that something else usually came from New York. It was a sad period for those of us who were fond of radio and enjoyed radio and indeed had been brought up in radio. And it was not sour grapes. 